Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video, we're going to look at HOMO and LUMO molecular orbitals, specifically in conjugated systems, as you'll see them in organic chemistry reactions. Organic chemistry is all about the reaction mechanisms. You have a molecule, attacks another one, and gives you a product. But to truly understand why the reactions happen, and even more specifically, where on the molecule they happen, we need to understand the concept of HOMO and LUMO, where HOMO stands for highest occupied molecular orbital and LUMO is lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Don't worry, we'll keep it simple with less focus on the math and physics that you learned back in general chemistry and more of an overview that actually makes sense so that you can apply it to reactions. In the last video, we looked at molecular orbitals for sigma and pi bonds, specifically molecules that have just one pi bond. You can review that using the link below or going to my website, layerforsci.com slash MO theory. When you have a system with more than just two electrons in the molecular orbital system, as you'll see in conjugated molecules like 1,3-butadiene or 1,3,5-hexatriene and so on, how do you figure out how many bonding and antibonding orbitals you have and what do they even mean? As a reminder, the number of atomic orbitals has to equal the number of molecular orbitals because each one gets converted to the other, which means that in the butadiene, we have four electrons involved in the conjugated system. That's four atomic orbitals to give us four molecular orbitals. And in the hexatriene, where we have six electrons in the conjugated system, we will have a total of six molecular orbitals. When we looked at a bond with two electrons, we compared it to a relationship, a couple made of two people. When we're looking at four or six, let's just think of them as a group of friends, where sometimes they all get along, sometimes there are groups within the groups that get along, and sometimes none of them get along. When it comes to drawing the interactions in molecular orbitals, we draw the orbitals with the most number getting along, then we cut it in half and then cut each piece in half. So what on earth am I talking about? This right here represents a group of four friends and the four different molecular orbitals. In the lowest energy, when they're all getting along, they are all very happy. If a rift forms so that we cut the group in half, meaning we put a node in between them, we have these two getting along and these two getting along, but the two groups don't get along with each other. They're still considered stable because for the most part the group is still getting along, but it's slightly higher energy because there's that rift going on between them. But if we take it a little bit higher, now we have a situation where we only have the two in the middle that get along with each other, but there's a fight between the two in the middle and that one on the right, as well as a fight with the one on the left. Right now we're starting to get into troublesome territory because they're not really getting along. It's only these two that are getting along with two nodes in this system. And in the final drawing, we have the most unstable, most unhappy, highest energy system where none of the friends are getting along. They're all fighting with each other, putting a node between each and every person, making it the most unstable situation. Let's take this and apply it to how you would draw a system for the 1,3-butadiene that this is based off. In each situation, we have a molecule, four carbons, that has four p orbitals, one on each carbon. In the lowest energy system where everyone is getting along, all of the orbitals are perfectly aligned, they're all overlapping, and the way we're going to represent that is showing the dark colors all together and the lighter colors all together, showing that electrons are able to flow between them because the orbitals, the way they're drawn, tells us a probability density of where that electron could be found. That means in this case, the electrons are free to move over the entire molecule. But now if we add a rift in the system, like a fight between the two groups, we're going to see that node in the middle so that the two on the left have their orbitals parallel, but the two on the right, even though they're parallel to each other, are anti-parallel to the other group. And since the colors don't overlap, 
the electrons can only flow between the right two and left two, but they can't pass the middle because we have a node. Same thing for the third. Now we have the two in the middle getting along. That means their orbitals are aligned the same way. And the two on the outside are anti-parallel. So there's a node sitting over here and over here, not allowing the electrons to flow between them. And last but not least, we have our highest energy system where none of the atoms are getting along. And that means none of the orbitals are aligned in the same direction. And the electrons are stuck on the atom that they're part of. They can't go anywhere. As you can see, we have three nodes in this system, making it very unstable. This molecule, the 1,3-butadiene, has four pi electrons for two pi bonds. And that means the four atomic orbitals turned into four molecular orbitals, as we see here, but there's only four electrons. So outside an extreme situation that forces the electrons to go to higher energy, we expect to find two of the electrons at the lowest energy molecular orbital and the next two electrons at the next lowest energy molecular orbital. If there's energy added to the system, they can temporarily jump up here or up here. But when that energy is removed, they prefer to sit in the lowest and most stable position. Since the electrons are sitting in the lower two molecular orbitals, we can draw a line in the middle between the top and the bottom and recognize that the lower two drawings represent the occupied orbitals and the upper two represent the unoccupied. And this is where the fun comes in. Of the two occupied systems, notice that this one is higher in energy than this one, which makes sense because it's higher up. And that means this drawing right here is considered the highest occupied molecular orbital. And when we look at the two unoccupied, we recognize that this right here is the lower energy of the two because it's lower down. And that means this right here is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital or LUMO. And what I used to find confusing is that lower is actually higher on the graph and higher is lower on the graph until I understood what it meant. HOMO represents the molecular orbital sitting directly under that line that separates them or smack dab in the middle of the graph. LUMO represents the one sitting right above it. And in reactions, you'll have the electrons that occupy the HOMO or LUMO as the ones that react, which you'll see in your Diels-Alder reaction, your pericyclic reactions, and so much more. Now, I want to show you one more thing, which is not how you want to think of it. And if you draw this on your exam, you'll probably lose points. But this is what finally made it click for me. So I want to show you just to have it in the back of your mind for understanding. To understand what all of this means, what I actually picture in my mind when looking at problems that have the orbitals written out like this, here's what I picture. I have the skeleton for my 1,3-butadiene. And when they're most stable at the lowest molecular orbital, I just imagine complete resonance between the system. It's the most conjugated. The electrons are just all over. It's very stable. If we take it up a notch, I imagine that there are two pi bonds here. And even though the pi bonds are stable as is, there's no interaction between them. One stays to the right, one stays to the left without resonance. Remember that resonance equals stability. It helps stabilize a molecule. And that's why I see this as slightly less stable. Now, if I were to draw the resonance structure something like this, I would get a pi bond here, the electrons as a lone pair on the right side with a negative charge, and an empty or emptied carbon atom with nothing to replace that fourth bond, giving it a positive charge on the left side. This is how I imagine this molecule or this molecular orbital to be the first of the unoccupied unstable because now we've introduced a separation of charge. This molecule isn't very happy except for right here in the middle and it really doesn't want to sit in that position. And last but not least, I want you to imagine we take this pi bond and we break it with resonance and this pi bond breaking it with resonance giving me 
a lone pair of electrons here with a negative charge and this one with a positive charge, another lone pair with a negative, another positive, and this is just a complete and total disaster. This molecule has extreme separation of charge. It is so unhappy. It is so unstable. And it never wants to be in this position unless it absolutely has to because it's getting zapped with so much energy where this group of friends are just all out fighting, rolling on the floor, kicking, screaming, biting. I mean, this is chaos. Are you with me so far? Keep this in the back of your mind, knowing that this is what we actually care about. Please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and remember, we skipped over all the math and physics because that is not what you want to focus on when you're studying this for organic chemistry. Instead, you want to ask yourself, do I understand this enough to make sense? Can I draw out the orbitals for a butadiene or a hexatriene? Can I quickly and easily identify that line of demarcation in the middle and realize the one right under is homo and the one right over is lumo without going crazy, without worrying about wave functions and other crazy physics calculations? If yes, that's all you really need for organic chemistry. For even more on this, see the link below or visit my website layerforsa.com slash mo theory. Again, that's layerforsa.com slash mo theory. And to see how this works in actual reactions such as Diels Alder or pericyclic reactions, come join me in the organic chemistry study hall where I go through those reactions step by step and so much more. Full details on my website link below or go to layerforsa.com slash join. Again, that's layerforsci.com slash join.